So we're going to move into chapter five, um, and it's all about statistical reasoning. Um, and really, uh, this is a great chapter. It really kind of shows the practicality of math and um, how uh, how we go about uh, running numbers and uh, really statistics. Uh, everyone should really know at least a little bit about statistics because uh, it's really how we we develop. Um, policy and how lawmakers make laws. They base it on a lot of st statistical data. Um, but how do they get those numbers? How do they know um, that these surveys that they take, that they actually make to cause, um, to create certain policies work? Well, let's go ahead and just first start by talking about the fundamentals of statistics. So um, statistics is the science of collecting, organizing, and interpreting data. So, th so what you're doing here is it's you're not guessing. This is this is actual science, um, and the uh, there's a lot of um, <clears throat> important data that is described in uh, describing something. And basically, the stats are used to describe or summarize whatever you're trying to show. Now, the population in a statistical study, or I'll just say stat study, um, is the complete set of people being studied, but there's also something called um, a sample. Now, if it were possible to um, basically take a survey for everyone in the city of, let's say, Los Angeles, uh, then you almost wouldn't even need statistics. But obviously, to give everyone in the city of Los Angeles a, a, some sort of survey, uh, would more likely you'd use it as sort of like a sample, like you choose like a smaller um, group of people in that population. Uh, population parameters are specific numbers describing the characteristics of the population. So let's say the population you are uh, surveying is a low income population or an, a middle income population, uh, or let's say you're um, surveying a population that has a lot of immigrants or you're surveying a population that has um, people that are in the military, things like that. Same thing with sample uh, statistics. Again, you're, that's a number of people described by a certain characteristic. So let's take a look at an example here. Uh, I want to describe uh, population sample, uh, population parameters and sample statistics in this next example. So agricultural inspectors for Jefferson County measure the levels of residue from three common pesticides on 25 ears of corn from each of the 104 uh, corn producing farms in the county. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Uh, what would you think would be the population of this example. Well, the population of this example is actually all ears of corn grown in the county. Now you'll notice that they only took um, uh, 25 ears of corn from each of the 104 farms. So uh, obviously there are way more um, ears of corn per farm than 25 ears of corn. Imagine a farm uh, making money on only 25 ears of corn, that would be impossible. Um, so the population here is all the corn in the entire county. But obviously it'd be impossible for these inspectors to learn about every single ear of corn. Uh, if they were able to do that, we would not need statistics. Okay, so instead of actually checking all ears of corn, they actually just check a sample and the sample in this case is just 25 ears from each farm. So they probably walk into their farm uh, and then randomly choose 25 ears uh, from that farm to test uh, pesticides with. Now the population parameters in this case are the average level of re residue from the three pesticides on all corn grown in the county. And that will be based on the average levels of residue of the, um, of the sample. So again, 
Um, statistics is designed to uh, take some certain characteristics of something that you're trying to describe and you take a smaller sample of a giant population. Again, imagine you are trying to survey everyone in Los Angeles County. That'd be pretty much impossible to do. So instead you pick a sample of the of a sample set of, of people from Los Angeles County. Now obviously you don't want to just pick a certain neighborhood in Los Angeles. You have very rich na neighborhoods, you have very poor neighborhoods. Um, you kind of want to get a, a good sample of people that are, you know, rich, poor, and a lot of middle class, of course. Um, but there are ways to properly choose your sample in order not to skew your results. Uh, but in order to do this, you must follow the basic steps of uh, statistical studies. Uh, first of all, make sure you know clearly what is the goal of your study. Knowing the goal of your study is key. Uh, having a, and not only just knowing the goal, but making sure your goal is specific and well-defined. Two, be sure to choose a representative sample from the population. Again, if I wanted to go around to every single house in Los Angeles County and ask them, who are you voting for? And I, could, and I wanted to do that all by myself. Um, I'd probably have to quit my job and um, I would still not even, I think, live long enough to be able to do that. So instead, what I would do is I want to go ahead and ask certain people from certain neighborhoods and make sure I get a good representative sample from the whole of Los Angeles County. Rich neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, and everything in between. Then you collect raw data from the sample and basically summarize this data by finding sample statistics of interest. And from these sample stats, you're going to use them to infer what potentially the population will do. So if you ever um, see those uh, polls uh, that they predict who the country is going to vote for, um, obviously they did not ask everyone in the country. But they ask a certain sample of people, and they give them their ideas of what they're going to, who they're going to vote for, and they use that, that picture to try to project onto the entire country. And they draw conclusions doing that. Now, is it a perfect science? Uh, in many ways, it's not. But in many ways, it is, it is a very accurate and um, uh, highly uh, sought-after science if these steps are followed properly. And I really like this next slide. This slide here really shows um, the process of actually setting up a, uh, the steps of um, a, a stat study. And you'll notice it's very circular. Um, that You'll notice that once you start and you identify your goals, it becomes this circular process of defining your population. Then from that population, you draw a sample. Then from that sample, you collect raw data. And then from that raw data, you make inferences about the population, and then you draw conclusions. And once you draw conclusions, you take your conclusions and you compare it to the population at large and decide whether or not that was an accurate study. And if not, then you do it again, and hopefully you get more and more accurate as you fo flow through the cycle uh, multiple times. Now, if your goals are identified clearly to begin with, you li literally can probably do this in one cycle. But let's take a look at another example. So each month, the U.S. Labor Department surveys 60,000 households to determine uh, the characteristics of the U.S. workforce. One population parameter of interest is the U.S. unemployment rate, defined as the percentage of people who are unemployed among all those who are either employed or actively seeking employment. So let's go ahead and describe how the five basic steps of a STAT study apply to this research. So again, what's the first goal? The first goal excuse me, the first step, excuse me, is to uh, specifically define what is our goal of this research. And our goal of this research is to learn about the employment within the population. And when you learn about the employment, then you, you know, by default, you learn about the unemployment of all Americans who are either employed or actively seeking employment. Now, obviously, we cannot survey everyone in the United States. That would be millions and millions and millions of sur surveys. But instead, what the Labor Department does is they send out a task force, and they go ahead and survey 60,000 households. So instead of 
sur uh, s surveying millions of households, they survey 60,000. So now 60,000 60, is a pretty pretty gi gigantic number to some, uh, you know, to, for some uh, task force. So hopefully the task force is big enough. But um, definitely 60,000 households is much smaller than the entire country. So we can see that this is how statistics help us uh, economically because to uh, hire and employ a task force that would ask everyone in the country about whether or not they're employed would be next to impossible financially speaking. So that's step two, finding a sample. Step three, uh, give them some sort of uh, survey. And in the survey, ask questions. For example, ask their questions whether or not they are employed, maybe how they're employed, how long they've, em they, how long they've been employed for. Um, and the responses from this smaller sample will constitute what is known as raw data for the research. And from this raw data, the Labor Department will make an estimate of the corresponding population parameters. Basically, from that raw data of the 60,000 households, they'll make some, make some conclusions or start to develop conclusions based on the entire country. So all this data is basically going to help us lead to step five where we will finally draw conclusions based on the population parameters and other information. And once again, once, once the, the study is done, they do some sort of uh, internal um, you know, uh, uh, testing to make sure that, that their survey was done properly, it was conducted properly, it wasn't, you know, people weren't uh, uh, filling out the, the surveys under duress or, or with some sort of uh, rushing way, like they basically were filling it out with, with you know, honestly and, and uh, with a clear mind. Um, and then hopefully that the Labor Department can show that these conclusions are, are legitimate and if not, then they, again, they just start the cycle over again and send the task force back out. And that, that doesn't mean that the first round was, was useless. It just means that they'll, they'll just refine uh, more, uh, more clearly what is uh, their goal in the research. Now, here are some more de definitions coming your way. <clears throat> um, so, for example, a representative sample. I've already kind of explained what that means. Um, now, again, let's say we wanted the survey, who are you voting for? Well, if what if we went out and we only surveyed very wealthy people? Well, um, very wealthy people tend to vote certain ways, and very poor people tend to vote certain ways. So if I were to go out and ask um, everyone in Los Angeles County, uh, if I wanted to know uh, who are they voting for, and I only spoke to very wealthy people, that would not be a res representative sample of Los Angeles County because obviously the wealthy people do not represent the poor people. And, and, and definitely neither the poor or wealthy represent the middle class. A representative sample is a sample that basically represents everyone, has some rich folks, has some poor folks, has some middle class folks. And preferably the uh, sample that you have is proportional to the population you're dealing with. So obviously there's not that many rich people, so I would assume that in a good representative sample uh, that there would be very few rich people being asked in the survey of what, of, of, let's say, who they're voting for or whatever the uh, research, re research goal is. So how do they pick these things? Because it's not actually, <clears throat> it's not as easy as it seems to choose a representative sample. So there are common sampling met methods of coming up with these samples. Uh, the first is just the simple random sampling. Which is actually, um, it says, it's funny because it says simple in the title, but it actually isn't as simple as you might think. Um, but um, basically, this is kind of like the equivalent of putting a bunch of names in a hat. So let's say I could put everyone's name uh, in the hat um, uh, from Los Angeles County, and I just put my hand in, mix it around really good, and pull out a name. In that sense, that in some ways is a, a simple random sampling. Uh, where everyone has an equal chance of being selected. <clears throat> this one's not used so much, but it is used in simpler uh, research research um, uh, endeavors. A much more common one in, in more complicated research endeavors is systematic sampling. Uh, for this one, this is kind of like, uh, for example, when you're going through TSA at the airport, um, many times, uh, not only TSA, but if you're just entering a government building, uh, they try not to discriminate, uh, as far as I understand, 
And what they do is they set out in the morning and tell themselves, okay, we're going to we're gonna search every 10th or every 5th, 50th person who comes in through the, those doors or who wants to board the airplane or whatever as to be more uh, systematic and not biased. Um, so basically, if they decide that they're going to go ahead and search every 10th or 50th person in line, they go ahead and do so. Convenient sampling. This is probably one of the worst ways to sample. Uh, convenient sampling is where uh, you basically do what's convenient. So um, let's say you're trying to run a survey and you only run your survey um, along the route on the way to your house. Um, if you only run your survey uh, because it's conveniently on the route on the way back to your house, uh, that would not pro that probably won't be uh, very, uh, very wise because you won't get a true sample of the population. For example, this is a good example right here. Uh, imagine that you wanted to uh, run a, uh, do a survey and you only ask the people that are in your classroom. Well, I mean, that might be an okay sample, but a better sample would be to go outside and maybe like talk to people that are happily, happen, happen to be walking by. Um, that would probably give you a much better idea of what the population is thinking. Now, another type of sampling is known as stratif stratified sampling. Stratified, stratified sampling um, is basically used when uh, you look at certain subgroups within a population. So, for example, um, like earlier I said that, you know, if you wanted to find out um, in general who is, who someone, who, who is, who's going to be voted for um, in the next election, um, and you wanted to ask everyone in Los Angeles County, um, you might want to go ahead and, of course, ask uh higher economic, uh, socioeconomic people, uh, low, low, low socioeconomic people, and also middle class. Um, but then within your sampling, you could actually identify each subgroup. And that also is a very uh, beneficial way of finding out who is voting for who. And I really like this example that you can find in the book. Um, they actually show you uh, different ways of actually finding, um, getting a sample together. Um, so... Uh, for example, a simple random sampling, if you have like a computer, in fact your calculators, your fancy TI-84 calculators, uh, those actually have a feature on them where you can actually do a true random sampling and that every uh, person or number or whatever ha what have you um, has an equal chance of being um, picked or selected. Um, systematic sampling is what I said earlier. Okay, how about every third person gets searched when they walk into government building? So one, two, three, search. Um, one, two, three, search, one, two, three, search. Uh, convenient sampling, again, this is a little bit, um, I, I'd say not very accurate because, again, this person only uh, is surveying the, the, the guy that's walking his dog past her apartment window. So that, to me, is not uh, a great way to sample, but, you know, in some ways it does have its uses. Obviously, that would be very economically um, um, uh, uh, efficient, right? Uh, and then stratified, uh, uh, stratified sampling is like looking at subgroups. So, for example, um, you know, you look at men versus women, or rich versus poor, or older versus younger, things like that. Okay, so let's say um, let's look at some different types of studies. So, let's say we are um, conducting a survey of students in a dormitory. Uh, you choose your sample by knocking on the door of every tenth room. Which kind of Sample uh, sampling method is that? That's pretty easy, right? That one's going to be the systematic sample. Um, to me, that's a pretty good way of uh, conducting a survey. Next, uh, to survey uh, opinions on a proposed new water line, a research firm uh, randomly draws the addresses of 150 uh, homeowners from a public list of all homeowners. So they probably like go any, mini, miny, mo, close their eyes and just kind of point to some name on a, in a book, or let's say, like kind of pointing in a, uh, a book of yellow pages or something like that. So this would be just simple random sample because everyone has a good chance of uh, being represented in the population. They'll all have equal chances. Next. The agricultural inspectors for the, uh, the oh, the, the example from earlier, they, they wanted to check 25 years of corn from each of the 104 corn-producing uh, farms in the county. 
So this would be known as stratified sampling. Basically, they go ahead and stratify their sampling by checking a, a subgroup of corn from each of the farms. Anthropolo anthropologists determine the average brain size of early Neanderthals in Europe by studying skulls found at the at three sites in southern Europe. Okay, well, for this one, it's kind of interesting because this one, um, well, um, there's probably not very many of these, right? So um, they're probably going to take what they can get. And, and not only that, they're already anthropologists. So they're probably already digging up stuff, and they probably happen to come across some early Neanderthal uh, skulls. So to me, this is actually uh, a, a good example of uh, convenience sampling. Because really they have little choice, but they're already digging up dirt in that area. Now the whole purpose of sampling, and the whole purpose of sampling properly, is so that we avoid this next topic. And this next topic is something you want to avoid whenever you're trying to conduct a survey. It's really hard to do though, being that, uh, that we're humans. And that's bias. And bias, um, you know, a, a stat study can definitely suffer from bias if um, the conduct of the uh, people conducting the actual study favors certain results. So uh, the whole point is to try to avoid this at all possible. Obviously, we want to know the truth, and once we know the truth, we can get what we need or what we want. Um, but uh, I, you know, I understand that a lot of humans, we as humans, especially in the, this this day and age of politics and um, social media, we're always trying to get our way and try to push our, our agenda, right? So, but bias is definitely something that wants to that you know you want to try to avoid whenever trying to come up with your own sample. So one way to kind of um, uh, prevent this is to do what's known as an observational study. And what an observational study is, a true observational study, is that researchers observe or measure characteristics of a sample members but do not attempt to influence or modify these characteristics. And so for, for that is, is a pretty good study because that also helps you not to in, in basically put, push your own agenda into the study. Um, an experiment, though, is a uh, where you actually you, you basically apply a treatment uh, to some or all uh, sample members, and then observe the effect. So, for example, if you've ever heard of the uh, placebo effect, we'll talk about that a little later today. Uh, that is definitely one of the uh, ideas behind doing an experiment uh, to see if the medication or whatever really works. And uh, based on that. Um, we have two different types of groups in an experiment. A treatment group and a control group. A treatment group is uh, basically the ones who actually receive the treatment and a control group are the ones that um, don't receive the treatment and probably don't know that they have not received the treatment. Now there are some cases where it's okay that they don't know if they received the, 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 the treatment but many times it's it's good, it's better that the control group uh, does not know that they did not receive the treatment. Now it's important again that we randomly select these folks and that um, in, in this group of folks that they're all very similar. And it doesn't have to be people, it could also be you know animals or it could be um, inanimate objects where you're testing product, it could be a lot of things. And again, as I mentioned before, the placebo effect. A placebo lacks the active ingredients of the treatment being tested in a study, but looks or feels enough like the treatment so that participants cannot distinguish whether or not they received the placebo or the real treatment. Now, the placebo effect is when that uh, patients uh, believe that they are receiving their treatment and, and improve or the, the situation for them improves because they think they actually are being treated uh, accordingly. Uh, 
Uh, blinding is a good uh, method in, um, to, um, uh, to, to conduct um, experiments. Um, the point is that when you blind somebody, and what I mean by blind is not literally with their eyes or anything like that, it's just letting them know whether or not they actually are getting treated um, is going to be, uh, in a lot of ways, very beneficial. Uh, for example, uh, there's a single blind experiment where the participants do not know whether or not they are members of the treatment group or the control group. But the experimenter, experimenters do know. That's very important. So the participants do not know which group they're in, and the experimenters do know. And which is a good one. This is actually a really good experiment because um, the, the participants cannot uh, push their bias into the... Um, or it's going to be very hard for the, the participants to push their bias in the in the cert, in the stat study, uh, but where it could be a little bit um, dicey is uh, the experimenters uh, do know if who's in the control group and who's in the treatment group, so that actually would might cause the um, the uh, the experimenters to potentially push their bias a little bit, but hopefully they are they are conducting a um, honest um, an honest experiment. Uh, but I, I'd say one of the best ways to really conduct a cert, a, a stat study is called a, a double double blind study where neither the participants or nor the experimenters uh, know who truly has the treatment group and who truly belongs to the control group when neither party knows then the results of the experiment can in a lot of ways be more um, fruitful and potentially more truthful So let's look at some examples. Uh, what's wrong with this experiment? Um, for each of these experiments, let's go ahead and identify problems and explain how we can avoid the problems. So for example, a chiropractor performs adjustments on 25 patients with back pain. Afterward, 18 of the patients say they feel better. He concludes that the adjustments are an effective treatment. So again, he performs 25 adjustments Afterward, 18 of the patients say they feel better. Okay. Well, the 25 patients who received adjustments represent what's called a treatment group. But this study lacks a control group. Basically, everyone is getting the same treatment. Okay. So the patients might be feeling better just because of a, of a placebo effect. They, uh, rather than um, feeling the real effect of any adjustments, um, you know, the chiropractor might have improved his study by hiring an actor and just do a fake adjustment um, on the control group. Uh, but then he could have compared the results of the two groups. So basically, this group was a purely just a pure treatment group. There was no control group. So in this case, I would uh, agree with this uh, this uh, decision here to go ahead and hire an actor. Or someone to fake some adjustments on some of the 25, or maybe uh, get another group of 25 patients, and that will be purely the uh, control group. All right, next, a new drug for a type of attention deficit disorder is supposed to make the effective, the affected children less disruptive. Now, some now they randomly selected uh, children suffering from the disorder are divided into treatment and control groups. Those in the control group receive a placebo that looks just like the real drug. The experiment is single blind, which means that the experimenters uh, know who they should give the, uh, the drugs to and who they should give the placebo to. And experimenters, they also interview the children one-on-one -on -one to decide whether, uh, whether they become more polite and less disruptive. Uh, the problem is that these experimenters might, as they make these interviews, they're going to know which kid took the drug and which kid did not take the drug. So when they actually interview these children, they're going to know, they're going to speak to the children differently and see if the children um, are behaving differently based on the fact that they know who has the drug and who, has, who does not have the drug. So this experiment should have been what's called a double blind, where they, the experimenters do not know um, at least initially, who has taken the drug and who has not. Now, there are different types of stat studies. Uh, another stat study is known as a retrospective study or case control study. 
And basically, it's an, it's an observational study that uses data from the past, such as official records, um, and basically uses those cases from the past uh, to potentially uh, make some conclusions. It divides a, into a group of cases who engaged in the behavior under the study and a group of controls who did not. And that's literally what the word means, retrospective. We're looking back on uh, past cases. Okay, so let's go ahead and answer some questions here. Um, let's see what kind of study we're dealing with here. So let's say we have, um, we wanted to know what is the average income of stock bro brokers? Well, okay, um, now, um, well, I'm sorry, I, I should rephrase. Um, we want to know which study would be best for this situation. And for me, this one, the best study would be the, the observational study. Because an observational study just takes the, the just the average of the income of the stockbrokers, and we only need to find that by observing the brokers. We don't need to uh, sample, or we don't need to do anything else, but just check their income and average their income. So to me, that's an observational study. Next, do seatbelts save lives? How can we prove that? Well, um, it would obviously be unethical. Uh, to tell people, hey, don't wear your seatbelts and see what happens. Um, we definitely don't want to do that. Uh, but definitely there are cases where a, a police officer arrives to the scene and sees that you know the, the people were, were or were not wearing their seatbelts. And of course that goes into their report and then goes into the official records and, and, and past, uh, past records. So to me, this would be a good case to use a retrospective study. Again, telling people not to wear their seatbelts is unethical. Uh, but looking back on a retrospective study, you can see that okay, here are, you know the proportional people that the portion of people that died not wearing a seatbelt, and the proportion of people that did not die or survive uh, using their seatbelt. Can lifting weights improve runners' times in a 10-kilometer race? <clears throat> Now, for me, this would require what's called an experiment. And basically, we experiment by uh, letting one group of runners be put on a very strict weightlifting program, and a control group will, will be asked to stay away from weights uh, and make sure that, uh, that you have plenty of runners that are like kind of like the same uh, ability. Um, but, um, you know, you could also just, as long as they're improving their own times, uh, you can probably tell pretty well whether or not the uh, experiment worked by looking at their times at the end. Um, now here, uh, this, this would, we would not be able to blind anybody because it's pretty obvious when you're weight, lifting weights or not. So unfortunately, a single or double blind um, uh, experiment could not happen. Now, uh, what about this? Now, a new herbal remedy reduces the severity of colds. Now, this is a perfect example of where it's going to be important to do a double-blind experiment. So, if you ever heard that in, like, let's say someone's trying to sell you something, some herbal remedy or some vitamins or whatever, uh, if they use the phrase double-blind experiment, well, then now you can probably trust them a little bit more. I would still research and make sure it was truly a double-blind experiment uh, because you never know who's actually conducting the experiment. The experimenters might be um, from the company that makes the herbal remedy. So if they are, it would be a, a huge conflict of interest um, for them to even run the experiment. But certainly a huge conflict of interest if they knew who actually took the herbal, herbal remedy and who did not. So this would be a good, good situation for a uh, double blind experiment. Now, of course, like I said earlier, statistics is not a perfect science all the time. There's a lot of perfection. There's a lot of stuff that is perfect about it, but there's a lot of also um, uh, margins of error where things can actually happen where it's not really 100% sure. Uh, that's where we use what's known as a um, uh, conf confidence interval. And a confidence interval basically takes the what's called the sample statistic and subtracts the margin of error up to the sample statistic and then adds the margin of error. So as we take a look at this, um, 
let's go ahead and look at an example. And let's go ahead and find out uh, the margin of error. So let's take a look at, um, let's say we have an election, election Eve poll that says that 52% of surveyed voters plan to vote for Smith. She needs a majority vote, more than 50% to win without a runoff. The margin of error of the poll is three percentage points. Will she win? Well, once again, you take the 52% and you, you add and subtract 3%. Um, and uh, let's say that we could be 95% confident that the actual percentage between her will vote between 49% and 55%. Um, this particular case, uh, it's a good, there's a good chance she'll win. Um, you know, 49% is pretty close to the 50% that she needs, more than 50%. But because it, it does dip down below 50%, it's just too close to call. Um, there's really no way to be sure, even if you're 95% confident. And this concludes our uh, lesson for 5A on stats. I'll be going more in depth with these and discussing these more with uh, 5B next class. But um, if you have any questions, again, please email me or chat me, and I'll try to get to you as soon as I can. Thanks.